ABC News Live. Tonight, all of the major developing stories here on Prime. Just days after House Republicans launched a ramped up impeachment probe into President Biden, his son Hunter is now indicted on felony gun charges. What it means for the president and the 2024 campaign. Plus, you know, the company's gonna fight back and we gotta just, we gotta stand together and keep fighting. Auto workers are on the verge of striking and causing a major disruption for American consumers. In tonight's Prime Focus, we go to Lordstown, Ohio and look beyond today's labor fight into the future battles that lie ahead. And I'm a, a mammal, a child of God, a, 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 a McConaughey, a Texan, and an American, and a human before I was ever a celebrity. I sit down with Oscar winner Matthew McConaughey, talk about him stepping into the literary world, and what inspired him to pick up the pen and start writing in the middle of the night. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more. Including the millions now under flood warning as Hurricane Lee makes its way up the Northeast, plus the ongoing cyber attacks that are bringing some of the biggest resorts in Las Vegas to a complete standstill. And her comedy genius earned her an Emmy, and now she's taken her talents on the road in a new show. I sit down with former late night host Samantha B. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering all of the night's developing stories for us. But we begin with Hunter Biden and the criminal indictment the president's son now faces. The three felony count indictment is related to his purchase of a firearm back in 2018 when he was addicted to crack cocaine. It comes after the collapse of a plea deal Hunter Biden made resolving two tax misdemeanors and a gun felony. Special Prosecutor David Weiss was appointed by former President Trump and was kept on by President Biden. After the plea deal collapsed, Weiss asked Attorney General Garland to elevate his status to special prosecutor. Of course, all of this comes as House Republicans have stepped up efforts to use Hunter Biden's work abroad to try to build a case to impeach President Biden. Regardless of what happens on Capitol Hill, Democratic voters may be growing weary of President Biden. A recent CNN poll found 67 percent of Democratic voters believe the party should nominate someone other than Biden in 2024. Our Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas leads us off tonight from Washington. Tonight, the president's son indicted on three felony federal gun charges, accused of lying about his drug use to purchase a handgun and then possessing that gun illegally. Hunter Biden bought the Colt revolver in 2018 when he was at the height of his addiction. He has acknowledged using crack cocaine at times as frequently as every 15 minutes. I went one time for 13 days without sleeping and smoking crack and drinking vodka exclusively throughout that entire time. But when Biden bought the gun, he filled out a form saying he was not a drug user, which prosecutors say made the purchase and possession of the gun illegal. Felonies that could put him in prison for more than a decade. The indictment comes after the collapse of Biden's plea deal with the U.S. Attorney for Delaware, David Weiss, appointed by Donald Trump and kept on by Attorney General Merrick Garland to complete the investigation. Weiss had been digging into Hunter Biden for five years, and it seems that they had agreed to a diversion agreement where he wouldn't face a felony gun charge if he complied with certain conditions. Biden had also agreed to plead guilty to misdemeanor tax crimes, acknowledging failing to pay taxes he has since paid. But that deal fell apart, and soon after, Weiss asked Garland to name him special counsel. Mr. Weiss has the authority he needs to conduct a thorough investigation and to continue to take the steps he deems appropriate independently. Tonight, Hunter Biden's attorney accusing the special counsel of bending to political pressure from Republicans in Congress insisting Hunter Biden possessing an unloaded gun for 11 days was not a threat to public safety and arguing that the original deal to drop the gun charge should remain in place. Today's news coming as President Biden was delivering a speech on the economy. No comment on his son's indictment. There's a lot more I know we could talk about. I wish I had a chance to take all your questions, but I'm going to get in real trouble if I do that. The president has remained tight-lipped on this from the beginning. For more now, let's get right to Pierre Thomas in Washington. Pierre, what's next for Hunter Biden? Well, the president's son must now turn himself in, appear in court for arraignment, and face the prospect of a full-scale trial. And that may not be all. Lindsay, the special counsel investigation of Hunter Biden's financial dealings is ongoing. Pierre Thomas for us. Our thanks to you, Pierre. Pleasure. 
Tonight, there's growing danger to coastal areas up and down the east coast as Hurricane Lee pushes its way up the eastern seaboard. We've already seen huge waves from Florida to Maine. Lee remains an enormous storm. You can see it there stretching more than 300 miles from the center. Tonight, Maine is under a rare hurricane watch. Our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano joins us now. Rob, time this all out for us. Well, Lindsay, we just got word from the hurricane hunters that this wind field, as you mentioned, is huge and continues to expand. Right now, it's about uh, 640 miles from, from where I stand and heading uh, due north. The track hasn't really changed all that much, nor have the impacts. So we're getting the surf here in Rhode Island, and the surf up and down the East Coast will continue with uh, rip currents and beach erosion into the weekend. It probably will weaken some as it gets farther north into cooler waters, but that wind field will still be massive, and by Saturday morning, its closest approach to the U.S. as a hurricane will bring tropical storm force winds to the Cape and through eastern Mass, including Boston, up through Portland and Bar Harbor, where watches have been upgraded to tropical storm warnings. Throw down the rain, it's left loaded, so that's not good news for already saturated, saturated uh, uh, Maine. And uh, we're just getting very, very uh, solid evidence that uh, the surf has arrived here in Narragansett. Over 50 mile an hour winds across parts of Maine through Saturday, so we'll see widespread uh, power outages, I think. But the big storm surge will be across Atlantic Canada, but obviously the big rough waves We'll be up and down the East Coast. We're still two hours from high tide here, uh, Lindsay, and it is getting uh, hairy. We're moving back for sure. Back to we you. see you're getting a little wet there already, Rob. Our thanks to you. Stay safe. We turn now to the looming strike as the United Auto Workers Union and the big three auto companies have yet to hammer out a new contract. The union says walkouts will begin at midnight Eastern tonight, which would mark the first collective action against the three auto companies at the same time. While the strike could be costly for the companies, the workers and American consumers, the union says the imbalance in company profits and worker pay cannot continue. ABC's Terry Moran has the very latest outside Detroit tonight. Tonight, nearly 150,000 American auto workers are gearing up to walk off the job at midnight in the first ever strike against all of the big three U.S. automakers. We are preparing to strike these companies in a way they've never seen before. The UAW is turning to new tactics to ramp up the pressure, targeted strikes to disrupt operations at certain plants. Tonight, there is still no deal in sight. Workers want a 40% increase in wages over the next four years, in line with the 40% increase they say their CEOs have made since the last contract. And they want pensions, better retiree health care, and cost of living adjustments. The auto workers at UAW Local 600 build the Ford 150 truck. You guys are building like the most popular vehicle in America. Number one selling truck in the world. Our members here work 11 hours a day, six and seven days a week, building the most iconic vehicle for a Ford Motor Company, and, you know, they want a fair share in the profit. Those big three profits are soaring, $21 billion in just the first six months of this year. We asked Ford's CEO about something workers bring up a lot, his $20 million pay package. They're asking about CEO pay. Yours, the CEO, made $20 million, and they say a 40% increase since the last contract. Why can't they get a 40% increase? Well, I, th I think, f first of all, um, we are offering an incredible, unprecedented increase. But we can't even get any feedback from the UAW about what they want. All they want is for everyone to make $300,000. That's not sustainable. We'll go bankrupt if we do that. Ford insists the company can't afford that total compensation package the union wants for its workers. Ford and GM are out with new offers, a 20% wage increase, just half of what the union is looking for. So they still seem quite far apart. Terry Moran joins us now from Michigan. Terry, if this strike does move forward, where would we see the impacts first? Lindsay, here, obviously, in Michigan, still the heart of the American automobile industry. If the strike begins tonight and it lasts for a few weeks, uh, there are actually 10 states uh, with major auto industry employers that would get hit hard. But Michigan hit first and hardest, up to 300,000 workers here, potentially without a paycheck. But the other states, you know, they, they include Illinois, Texas, Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, Kansas, Tennessee, even New York. Uh, this is a situation that would have major, certainly regional and even national economic impacts. Lindsay? Far-reaching. All right, Terry Moran for us. Thanks so much, Terry.
Cyber attacks are doing significant damage at casinos from Las Vegas to Atlantic City, shutting down slot machines and ATMs at MGM properties. And Caesars is now revealing that they paid a $15 million ransom before MGM was hit. ABC's Momo Lange is in Las Vegas. Tonight, a massive cyber attack taking down one of the most recognizable names on the Las Vegas Strip, MGM Properties, under siege since Sunday. The casino floor at the MGM Grand, quiet, without the ringing of slot machines. Messages on screen read, out of service. At New York, New York, some slots are working, but the voucher cash-out system is not. If you want to get any money back at all, then you have to have an employee do it manually. MGM's websites, down. Also affected ATMs, hotel key cards, some guests being lit in by security with physical keys, also room charges and check-in. The line at the Bellagio, operated by MGM, snaking through the lobby, employees handing out water to frustrated customers. Check-in procedure is kind of messy, a lot of long lines, gambling's really messy, it's not as fun when you have to wait. It's not just Vegas. MGM casinos and hotels across the country, including Atlantic City, experiencing outages. And today, Caesars Palace in Las Vegas revealing it too was the victim of a cyber attack, paying a $15 million ransom days before MGM was breached. MGM Resorts now working with local law enforcement, the FBI, and cybersecurity experts. They say they're working diligently to get back online. Whether this was ransomware, the, whether this was malware, one would have to think that this was a fairly sophisticated group that launched the attack. Mola Lange joins us now from Las Vegas. Mola, do we know who's behind these cyber attacks? Well, Lindsay, cybersecurity analysts tell ABC News that a Russian-speaking hacking network provided the ransomware used in the MGM attacks to a group called Scattered Spider, a hacker allegedly impersonating an MGM employee on the call with their help desk, was able to take down the entire MGM system in just 10 minutes, Lindsay. Mola Lange for us from Las Vegas. Thanks so much, Mola. Tonight, that escape killer who was captured after nearly two weeks on the run outside Philadelphia is spending his first full day in a maximum security prison where he will serve his life sentence. But first, Danilo Calicante answered questions about how he survived as a fugitive, how close searchers came to finding him, and he, where he was aiming to go. Trevor Alt reports. Tonight, authorities revealing new details from convicted killer Danilo Cavalcante, how they say he claims he evaded police for 13 days after this daring escape from Chester County Prison. He described things such as going to a watermelon patch, surviving on watermelons, uh, drinking stream water. Cavalcante speaking with investigators for four hours, telling them he hunkered down in the thick woods, narrowly avoiding capture. We were literally right on top of him, but the environment worked to his advantage. This weekend, Cavalcante Conte stealing an unlocked van, driving 25 miles north, a doorbell camera showing him clean shaven, having stolen a backpack with a razor inside. And tonight, we're learning he surveilled homes before breaking in, this week stealing a rifle from an open garage. Ultimately, his end game, he described to us, was carjacking somebody, and that's why he held on to that rifle. His intent was to head north to Canada, and he also expressed a desire to get down to uh, Puerto Rico as well. But early Wednesday morning, tactical units surrounding Cavalcante, this Customs and Border Protection canine taking him down, and that moment of celebration from authorities as the manhunt was finally over. Subject is in custody, confirmed subject is in custody. Did you say the subject is in custody? Yes! That canine getting a lot of credit. Trevor all joins us now once again. Trevor, uh, what else did Cavalcante tell authorities? So what investigators told us, Lindsay, is that he revealed something about his own psyche leading up to this escape at the tail end of that four-hour interview. Basically, what they say is, you'll remember, Cavalcante murdered his ex-girlfriend. He's also wanted for a 2017 murder out of Brazil. And what investigators say is that he told them he knew he had to pay for what he had done. He just wasn't willing to pay with his life. Lindsay? Trevor Alt for us once again in Chester County, Pennsylvania. Today, we learned that former President Trump will not go to trial next month in the election racketeering case in Georgia's Fulton County. Trump is one of 19 defendants in the case, and the judge overseeing it is now saying that the trial for two of them who requested a speedy trial will begin on October 23rd. Here's ABC senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky. 
Prosecutors in Georgia wanted to put former President Trump on trial together with all 18 of his alleged co-conspirators. But tonight, the judge said that's not going to happen. Thank you. Please be seated. Instead, Judge Scott McAfee ruling two defendants who requested speedy trials, attorneys Sidney Powell and Kenneth Chesborough, can be tried next month separately from their co-defendants. Powell pushed the false conspiracy theory about Georgia voting machines controlled by Venezuela. Chesborough allegedly plotted to send fake electors to Washington to block certification of Joe Biden's victory. The judge hoping to have a jury seated quickly. We're going to be making the attempt to have this jury sworn by the deadline of November 5th. Chesborough's attorney says that might be hard. I don't know that there's really anyone in Fulton County who hasn't heard of this case, and I don't know that there's anyone that doesn't have a strong opinion one way or the other about, you know, the former president and the people who associated with him. So we, we recognize the challenges. This early trial could give Trump a sneak peek of what he will face. Prosecutors have said the witnesses and the evidence are the same for every defendant since they're all charged with being part of a sprawling conspiracy to change the outcome of the Georgia vote and keep Trump in power. They've each pleaded not guilty. Aaron Katursky joins us now. Aaron, so these two defendants have requested a speedy trial. Do we have a sense at all when the remaining defendants, including the former president, could go on trial? We don't yet, Lindsay, but the judge did say today he wants the lawyers to get some of the pretrial paperwork out of the way by December 1st. So that suggests he does not want this case to drag out indefinitely. The judge also did not rule out breaking up the defendants even more, citing some logistical concerns. Lindsay, he said there just isn't a courtroom big enough in Fulton County to handle everybody. Lindsay? Makes sense. All right, Aaron Katursky, our thanks to you. Next tonight to the grim aftermath of that flood catastrophe in Libya and the mounting death toll, at least 6,000 dead, 9,000 more still missing, and at least 30,000 people have been displaced. Tonight in the hard-hit city of Derna, mounting questions about why those two dams failed. Our chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel has the latest. Tonight, growing questions about what caused the Libyan flooding disaster. Today, the dead were buried in mass graves amid a humanitarian catastrophe. This is what remains of the coastal city of Derna. More than 6,000 men, women and children died here, with fears the death toll could reach as high as 20,000. City residents bewildered. A lot of people are under the mud. It's a disaster. It's, it's just a disaster. The coastal city was deluged by a wall of water reported to be nearly 23 feet high in parts. Two dams near the city buckling under the weight of storm water. Today, the Libyan prime minister admitting there was a failure to maintain the two dams built over four decades ago. And the UN claiming Libyan weather warnings were inadequate, failing to issue any evacuation orders and officials saying we could have avoided most of the human casualties. That's just so difficult to hear. Ian Panel joins us now from Cairo. Ian, what are you and officials saying about the sheer magnitude of this crisis? Yeah, I mean, the uh, Libyan UN ambassador gave a briefing to the press, and he was asked repeatedly about the numbers of casualties. I mean, we've seen different figures out there. We now know officially it's more than 6,000, but there's at least 9,000 or so missing. Uh, his point was, and he used this phrase, a magnitude of death, is that it's very difficult to know at the moment. Just because of the scale of the disaster, many people are buried under enormous amounts of mud and debris. What he did say, though, is that 30,000 people lived in the neighborhoods that were hardest hit. And that's what we see on the satellite images, the ones that have been washed away. And as aid arrives from the U.S. and others, the needs on the ground for the dead and for the survivors are only growing. Lindsay? You can imagine. All right, Ian Panel for us from Egypt. Thanks so much, Ian. In Morocco, new video captures the frightening moment an aftershock struck. Search teams that had been combing through the destruction were seen running for cover as the ground once again shook beneath them. The official death toll from the 6.8 magnitude earthquake is quickly closing in on 3,000 lives lost. A luxury cruise ship that ran aground off the coast of Greenland has finally been pulled free. The 343-foot-long ocean explorer had run aground Monday above the Arctic Circle. A research ship from the Greenland Institute of Nature successfully moved the stranded boat during a high tide after two days of unsuccessful attempts. The vessel will now be inspected for damage. None of the 206 people on board were injured during the delay.
NASA has released their much anticipated report following a year long study of UFOs. The panel found no evidence that unidentified aerial phenomena or UAPs were extraterrestrial in origin, but Administrator Bill Nelson said he still believes there is other life in the universe. Nelson was also pressed on whether the government is hiding any evidence of aliens or spaceships responding to reporters, quote, show me the evidence. NASA says further study will require new scientific techniques like advanced satellites and named a new UFO research director. Still much more ahead on Prime tonight. Heart-stopping video shows adults rushing to get a group of children out of the water as an alligator swims toward them. But next in our Prime Focus, it's a fight that could set the stage for future labor battles. We go inside the push for union protections at an auto plant where they felt left behind by a trail of broken promises. We've had a lot of promises and a lot of people saying, boy, it'd be great if stuff like this had happened, but it never did. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. It's been called the summer of the strike. And tonight, on the eve of their contract expiration, the United Auto Workers Union and the big three auto manufacturers have seemingly reached a stalemate in their negotiations as the nation's auto workers threaten to strike. But in the shadow of their fight, another battle is just beginning. We traveled to Lordstown, Ohio, to take a look at the future labor battles ahead as battery plant workers building the electric cars of the future fight for stronger union protections. ABC's Alex Roche has this story in tonight's Prime Focus. Arno Hill says he's heard it all in his 25 years as mayor of Lordstown, Ohio. We've had a lot of promises and a lot of people saying, boy, it'd be great if stuff like this had happened, but it never did. The village, which is only 25 square miles, is home to a former General Motors plant that at one point employed thousands of unionized auto workers, making Wardstown a regular stop for presidential campaigns. Thank you. Thank you, Lordstown. But Mayor Hill now calls Lordstown and the surrounding Mahoning Valley the land of broken promises. You know, we were told one time we were going to get a Pentagon payroll center. That was in the mid 90s. Never happened. A blimp factory we were supposed to have made headlines, never happened. We did have an Avanti car company here in Youngstown for a while, but that didn't stay open very long. Last fall, President Biden promised the region good paying jobs in electric vehicle manufacturing. We're gonna do it the right way, creating good paying union jobs and protecting the environment and local communities. This is uh, important for the community, 
Now these workers say they're fighting to avoid another broken promise. Employees of Ultium Cell, a joint venture between LG Energy Solutions and General Motors, are building the cars of the future, but are afraid of being left in the past. There's a real push right now towards electric vehicles. We want to set the standard right here in Lordstown, Ohio. They create the lithium ion battery cells responsible for powering GM's electric vehicle fleet. But because their work is in EV technology, these workers are not considered auto workers, meaning they're left out of the current big three UAW contract negotiations. Our lowest wage at the facility is $15 an hour for a, uh, a material worker. Now they've just gotten a raise and are up over 20 now. And that's a big improvement, it is. And uh, I'm grateful for that. Um, but that same type of person could be making closer to 30 if they were in a big three plant. And all team cells ain't doing that. Now, workers are fighting for their place and a path forward. Knowing that if that my family is being taken care of, that I'm being taken care of, that I'm able to, supply, to provide for my family, that would mean the world to me. We have a lot of safety issues. I mean, At the top of their list of concerns, pay and safety. So there's chemicals in that plant. The science hasn't even caught up to the chemicals, right? So OSHA doesn't have standards yet on a lot of the chemicals that we're using inside that facility. The plant currently has five open inspections, according to OSHA. In a statement to ABC News, Ultium Cells says, quote, the safety and well-being of our team members is our top priority. Ultium Cells follows all federal, state, and local requirements for workplace and environmental safety, including those related to the handling of chemical materials. These jobs, again, are very, very technical jobs. These aren't jobs to where we just go in and they train you for one day or a half a day and you're good to go. These jobs take months and months. There's going to be jobs lost, okay, over the few next years over this and this transition and we're gonna need other jobs for our members to go fall into. We're making the batteries to make the vehicle go. Deep in the heart of the Rust Belt, Ultium employees like George Gorinitis say they know the power of a UAW contract. And I was hired into uh, General Motors here in Lordstown of uh, June 30th of 2008. I thought I was set for life. I, I really, honestly, I thought I was set for life. I knew, you know, I was gonna be going in making good money. I was gonna have great benefits. General Motors was the golden ticket here in the Trumbull County Mahoney area. But that golden ticket expired in 2019 with the closure of the General Motors plant in Lordstown, sending ripples throughout the community. I graduated high school and got hired right into General Motors. I don't have any background of anything. I never went to school and I never, you know, I didn't have any background for anything. So I was, I was scared, I was nervous. It just, it tore a lot of families and businesses apart. It, it, it was a big, it, it did a lot of damage to the area. The old plant, only a stone's throw from where Ultium operates today. And the workers should share in the huge profits uh, that these companies are making. Uh, people just want their fair share. Dave Delick thought he'd get his fair share working at Ultium. I applied at Ultium um, thinking, you know, it's going to be a, the next wave, the next, you know, future. So I'm thinking this could be a job I could retire from. Starting rate was $16.50. But I knew at the time the plant wasn't finished yet. I talked to some of the managers at Ultium and asked them, like, hey, what do you think we'll get a pay raise? You know, because us learning these machines, there should be some sort of incentive because 1650 was okay when we were sitting in the classroom learning, but now we're running these machines. Feeling the financial strain, Dave felt he had no choice but to take up a second job. I Tried to make it last as long as I could, working there for $16.50, but I had to go back to, uh, back to my previous job so I could make up my lost income from going to Altium, which, you know, it frustrated me because, to me, thinking, like, these are, again, two big companies. Me working one job, it would, I, I couldn't, I would not be at Altium right now if I just stayed there because that wage was not a sustainable, livable wage for me. With frustrations over wages growing, last year Dave and his fellow employees turned to what they knew, the union. We had a vote December 9th, we voted in the union. They got announced December 23rd that we were actually unionized. The first and only battery plant in the country to organize. I think I almost got $5, so I'm up to 23 now. But yeah, it's been a kind of a long uproad climb, like a mountain climb, I would say, not a hill. 
been a mountain climb. For now, the Ultium employees must negotiate their own contract. In a statement to ABC News, General Motors said, GM is confident that Ultium Cells and the UAW will work in good faith to reach a reasonable agreement that is appropriate for battery supply operations. But for some, this is bigger than Lordstown. They're hoping their fight can be a model for the emerging EV industry. We have a tradition of these contracts creating middle-class wages and giving families a middle-class lifestyle. And they have taken that away because of bad trade agreements and other things. We continue to fight for that. Their efforts gained national attention last month when the Biden administration and the Department of Energy announced a $15.5 billion funding package focused on, quote, retooling existing factories for the transition to electric vehicles, supporting good jobs, and a just transition to EVs. And it's in that pursuit of a just transition that the Ultium workers say they stand united. We're still here negotiating every day with the company. Um, it's still moving a little slow. Uh, it is getting better. You know, the company's gonna fight back and we gotta just, we gotta stand together and keep fighting. A lot of unrest in the labor world these days. Our thanks to Alex Brashay for that. Still much more to get to. Coming up, his amazing rescue captivated people around the world after he was trapped in a cave for days. Mark Dickey describes the dangerous ordeal. He's an actor, activist, and now children's book author. Matthew McConaughey tells us about his latest work, Just Because. I think every parent knows you start to see life through the lens mm -hmm. of having children. And you start to think that way. And um, this came to me in a dream one night. But next, it seems like more people are getting inked these days. We take a look at just how many Americans are getting tatted and the meaning behind their body art by the numbers. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 
It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. The origins of tattoos, did you know they date back to Neolithic times? But in modern history, what was once a mark of the military or a counterculture calling card has clearly gone mainstream. Here's Tattoos in America by the numbers. 32% of Americans, nearly one third, now have at least one tattoo. That's according to a recent survey from the Pew Research Center. And one tattoo often leads to another, with 22% reporting more than one design on their human canvas. Demographics matter. Women, for instance, are more likely than men to have one 38% compared to 27%. Add age to the mix, and some 56% of American women aged 18 to 29 have at least some ink. There's also the why. The survey found that 69% of tattooed adults say that honoring or remembering someone or something is the motivating factor for their body art. Only 24% actually expressed regret over their decision, and 80% said that tattoos have become more accepted over the past 20 years. With about 25,000 tattoo studios across the country, the art of ink has become big business to the tune of $2 billion in 2023, according to Fortune, and that number is expected to nearly double by 2030. And America's not alone. A British man just set a world Guinness record with 667 tattoos of his daughter's name, Lucy. Like it or not, tattoos are now a permanent part of our culture. And we still have much more to get to tonight on Prime. You may have heard her jokes on her Emmy-winning show. Now Samantha Bee is hitting the road. She tells us how her comedy tour is using a mix of satire and personal experiences to connect with her fans. And NSYNC just released music for the first time in two decades. Hear their new song and find out why they're reunited. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. A man recalls the harrowing moment he was rescued after being trapped inside a cave for days. A killer roams free for months after a murder is mistaken for a suicide. And see the terrifying moments an alligator swims toward a group of children. These stories and much more in tonight's Rundown. Seattle's mayor has responded after controversial body camera video that appears to show an officer laughing after a pedestrian was struck and killed by a patrol car. Mayor Bruce Harrell expressed condolences to the family of Janavi Kandula and said the comments in the video were not a reflection of the city or its communities. The statement comes days after footage was released of the January incident where Kandula was struck and killed by the patrol car in a crosswalk. In the video, a responding officer is heard saying, just write a check and laughing. <laughs> $11,000. She was 26 anyway. She had limited value. Police said the incident was under investigation. Mark Dickey, the American cave explorer, is stuck more than 3,000 feet underground for 12 days. He's recovering in a Turkish hospital. He was stuck after suffering internal bleeding. Dickey joined Good Morning America to speak about his experience. There's not that much that you tell yourself. Um, you kind of just survive. He says doctors are still trying to find the cause of his illness, but that he's improving. He said he was grateful to the rescuers who brought him to safety. Once we started moving, it, it happened a lot faster than I expected, so I was... Man, I was happy to get to the surface. Police in Louisiana say a woman who they initially said died of suicide was allegedly murdered. WBRZ reports that Christina Hobbs was found dead of a gunshot wound in December of last year, and officials had considered her death a suicide as there was no evidence to call it a homicide. Seven months later, Rachel Johnson was found dead of blunt force trauma at the same address, and police arrested Cedric Lang in her killing. Officials told WBRZ that Johnson's death led them to take another look at Hobbs' case. Lang is now charged in both women's deaths. Officials have not said what specific developments led them to look at Hobbs' case again. The Consumer Product Safety Commission is warning parents about the potential dangers of water beads. The agency and the company Buffalo Games are now recalling 52,000 Chuckle and Roar Ultimate Water Beads activity kits due to ingestion, choking, and other hazards. Experts say if a water bead is ingested, it can expand in the child's body, posing major risks, including intestinal obstruction. The company says it has received one report of a 10-month-old dying after swallowing these beads back in July. July, and a nine-month-old child was seriously injured after ingesting a bead in November of last year, requiring surgery to remove it. Look how big it is! A trip to a lake for a group of children, interrupted by an alligator. Uh -huh. The group was swimming in Lake Raven in Huntsville State Park when the 14-foot gator was spotted swimming right toward them. The video shows the children and other swimmers running out of the lake to safety and the gator turning around after being approached by one woman, though it stayed in the area. No injuries were reported. NSYNC reunited at the MTV Video Music Awards Tuesday night, and it turns out they weren't done. For the first time in 20 years, there's new music from the pop group. Just let me take you to the 
The group teamed up to record Better Place, which will be featured in the upcoming film Trolls Band Together. The song is featured at the end of the new trailer, which was just revealed. Before that, the band hinted at an announcement on Instagram Wednesday night. Do you know something? Do you know something? <laughs> Better Place will officially drop September 29th. Our next guest is no stranger to politics and comedy. You might know Samantha Bee from her Emmy-winning show Full Frontal with Samantha Bee, which was the longest-running satirical late-night show hosted by a woman, or from her time as the longest-serving regular correspondent on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Now the comedian and host is taking her talents on the road. Samantha's comedy tour, Your Favorite Woman, The Joy of Sex Education Tour, is back on the road for the fall, and Bee reminds audiences of the beauty of being a woman, saying the event is if a hot flash was a live show. It features a comedian's signature wit, satire, and personal experience that makes you feel seen and heard. We are lucky enough to have Samantha B joining us live in studio. How are you? I am very well, thank you. How are you? I am well. You have added actually 17 more dates to this tour, so it seems like people are eating it up, right? People are eating it up, and I love, do I love doing it so much that I just felt compelled. If people are willing to come and see the show, I am absolutely more than willing to bring it to them, so, so it's great. The joy of sex education. Let's yes. just start there. I mean, there's so much. That's a meal in and of itself. True. Where did you get the idea? What's it about? Well, as I've, you know, I'm 53 now. I'm turning 54 in the fall. And as I, like, ended up at this stage of my life, I realized that I really know nothing about my body. I really know nothing about the, I knew nothing about what I was undertaking uh, um, as a perimenopausal woman. And it made me really reflect on all the things that we know and don't know about our bodies, which is uh, a lot because most of us were taught uh, sex education by our mustachioed gym teachers. <laughs> and <laughs> I think most people do relate to that. And sex education is really not taught anywhere. I feel like we'd all be in such a better position if the full spectrum of our lives was talked about, discussed, laughed at, and that's what I do with the show. Predominantly women coming, or do you have a big no, mix? No, it's Ooh. a very mixed audience. Good. And, uh, and the men are receiving it with great vigor, <laughs> which I'm so pleased by. <laughs> we are all, you're probably doing a, a service for, for women and men out there. You know what? I'm just a, a soldier in the sex education <laughs> battles. <laughs> You said that this show will include everything that happens to our bodies from puberty to menopause yep. and beyond. Mm -hmm. It's a bloody good time. <laughs> yes. uh, what motivated you beyond your own experience? Was this something that you were sharing with your girlfriends or other female friends, uh, female uh, family members? Yes, I mean, you know, uh, I just looked around and all of my friends, women of my age group, we all felt that we were having the, these very private personal experiences of kind of losing it in our 50s. Like we, our bodies changed so much and all of us were having these very private experiences of thinking like, am I the, I must be the only person who feels absolutely like everything in my body is falling apart. Like I am like a, a school bus on fire and the wheels are coming off and it's just me, right? But as it turns out, all of my friends were experiencing it too and we all, <laughs> And I felt like a great cathartic moment was really needed. And so when I get to that part of the show, I wanna say that the people in the audience are literally screaming. Mm. They're like, I'm experiencing this too. <laughs> so I'm not quite 50, but that's what I have to look forward to. Uh, well, what did you say, a school bus on fire and the wheels are falling off? You know what I mean? If you come and see the show, you're gonna be so much better prepared. <laughs> okay, all right, that's good to know. I how do you hope to empower women through your comedy? I just feel like speaking our truth, like just speaking the truth about our bodies is so important. It's important for us to have knowledge about ourselves. It's important for us to know that we're not the only people going through it. And that's the only way to really make change is to just be honest and open. We are 50% of the population. We are 100% of the reason people exist in the first place. And we're, we have value and we have power and we have power when we come together and when we just speak our truth. And I truly feel that. I was gonna ask you what you want your audience to take away, but I, I think you may have just answered that. I think that's probably it. Why do you decide to inject 
politics into humor because there are a number of comedians, a number of people who really feel like that's too hot button. They just want to stay and wouldn't run the other direction. I feel like my whole career is about just speaking truth to power or just being unafraid. I mean, what can I do? But I'm not. I feel like I'm not really in this game to like win people over, convert people to my side. I'm just here to say the things that I think are very much worth saying. And this show is very much in that tradition. I feel like I need to see your show before yes. I turn 50. Just oh, so I know. 100%. What to expect. No surprises. Yes. <laughs> Samantha B, we thank you so much for joining us. And we do want to let our viewers know the fall leg of Samantha's comedy tour, Your Favorite Woman, The Joy of Sex Education Tour, kicks off at the Bushnell in Hartford, Connecticut on September 21st. He rose to fame as a leading man, and Matthew McConaughey's talent eventually earned him an Academy Award. But in the days after the Evalde school shooting, his activism took center stage as he pledged to help his own hometown. On top of an actor and activist, he's now adding another title, children's book author. Earlier this week, I had a chance to speak with McConaughey about his new book, Just Because, and his work to make schools safer across the country. You were already a New York Times best-selling author for your memoir, Green Lights. What made you decide, you know, I'm going to go out and write a children's book. Got three children, so you start to, I think every parent knows, you start to see life through the lens of having children, and you start to think that way. And um, this came to me in a dream one night, and I thought it was a, a really like, like a Bob Dylan ditty of a song, and it had this little meter in my mind, and I was dreaming to it. And just because they threw the dart doesn't mean that it's stuck. And just because you got skills don't mean there is no luck. Dun, 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 just because. And so I woke up. And I kept that, you know, when you wake up from a dream, you don't want to stop the rhythm of what you saw. I got it. And I started writing it down. And it sort of just came out on the page. And um, after four hours of writing, I decided, well, okay, I think I got my dream down. I went back to sleep, woke up, you come back and check it, because you want to check those 2.30 a.m. ideas to see if they still hold the next day. And, and, and it did. Just because you follow doesn't mean you're not a leader. Just because I keep winning doesn't mean that I'm a cheater. It feels like this is not just for children. I mean, for the adult reader, there's a takeaway here. I hope so. I mean, I've learned that through life. I used to think that if you were going to be a leader, you had to be in front. And I got in front many times where I should have been in front, and I got in front many times where I didn't know where I was going. Mm. And I shouldn't have been the one in front. And I started to learn that you're a better leader if you fall in behind someone who knows where they're going and you want to go, someone who has a good aim. Let's talk about the illustrations. One, the significance of the treehouse. Yes. For me, and I wrote about this in my book, Green Lights, that was my place to dream, to be with my own thoughts, to have my own stuff, to write in my own journal that I knew I didn't have to share with anybody because that was between me and my treehouse and whoever I wanted to invite to my treehouse. Your father of three, youngest is 10, so I know your kids have to give you feedback. What are their thoughts on the book? They, so far, so good. <laughs> I mean, my, my eldest thinks it's really cool, and my daughter's very visual, so she's a big fan of the art. And my youngest, so far, is probably acting like, ah, oh, yeah, it's all right. But he's come back to me a couple of times and said something where I'm like, you remember that? For the and he's like, <laughs> so he's letting me know that he did retain some, some things from the book. Uh, if, switching gears for a moment, we, we do know, of course, that uh, gun safety reform is, is near and dear to your heart, especially after uh, the shooting at Robb Elementary in your hometown of Uvalde. But every parent separately expressed in their own way to Camilla and me that they want their children's dreams to live on, that they want their children's dreams to continue to accomplish something after they are gone. They want to make their loss of life matter. Um, talk to us about the Green Lights Grants Initiative. Yes, so for the first time in 30 years, of bills passed, federal bills passed to help safe in schools, bipartisan. Um, there's billions of dollars to help safe in the schools through mental health and physically safe in the schools. In 2026, if that money's not spent, and the government wants to spend it, wants to allocate it, that money could be reallocated. What I found out is months and now even over a year later, since that bill's been passed and that money's there, federal grant's there to give that money to schools that need it, not many schools are applying. Mm. So we said, why? The math doesn't add up. We found out that the grant writing process is extremely complicated. Mm -hmm. 
um, the superintendent in each district that needs to fill out that grant is usually wearing two, three hats, doesn't have the time, they're driving the bus, the PE teacher, and they're, you want me to fill out this 50-page grant that's so damn intimidating, I don't have the expertise or the time. So we, in the Green, with the Green Lights Grant Initiative, we're going to have grant writers write grants for a lot of these highest need, lowest capacity schools. We have a website on greenlightsgrantinitiative.org that will shepherd any school district and superintendent through the grant writing process to give them the best chance of getting, uh, writing a grant that will be awarded. Because what happens to the money if it's not allocated? It can be someone, it can be repurposed. It can be, you can look at it and go, it wasn't spent. The government will say, we didn't feel the need. Well, the need's there. I, I know you've considered before being a, a politician, but, but you and your wife have shown us all that being a private citizen, you can impact the world. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest to, to people who are out there okay. just thinking, you know, I, I want to make change, okay. but I don't have the platform? That's a good question. Um, and I, my hunch is, is we're, we're, we're hitting something that could be a real sweet spot with the Green Lights Grant Initiative. We're private citizens working with the public sector, mm. the government. A lot of times we think as private citizens, well, government, my person's in office, it's all handled, I can sit back. No. Civics is a very not sexy word that Americans kind of get bored to even hear the word. <laughs> well, we need a little bit of a wake up call at the civics class. This is the Greenlight Grant Initiative is sort of a, a civics class in supply and demand. The private sector with the public sector need to work more together. You make civics sexy. We, we thank you for that on behalf of, of our It of can our, be. Of our Help nation. me out with it. I mean, it really can be, you know. What is it about you that you used your platform for good in this way? Because we, we see a lot of A-list actors mm. who are, are just about that life, right? But, but, but you seem to take it in a really heartfelt, different direction. Uh, what is it about me? I mean, look. I mean, one answer could be that I've, I've, I've always seen myself and it comes from my mantra, just keep living. You know, I'm a, I'm a, a mammal, a child of God, a, 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 a McConaughey, a Texan and an American and a human before I was ever a celebrity. Mm. I, I believe in people. I really do believe in people. I don't think we're gonna find a kumbaya answer to figuring all this stuff out. Is the Greenlight Grant Initiative the answer to gun violence in schools? No, it's not. But it damn sure is a step in the right direction that can be compounded Go move, moving forward. Thank you so much for your time and the book. Hey, you're welcome. All the best to you. Thank you. Our thanks to Matthew McConaughey. His new book, Just Because, is now available wherever books are sold. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. For the next hour, Hurricane Lee is churning in the waters off the East Coast. We go inside the storm with the Hurricane Hunters. And it could be the most expensive sweater in history. Why a piece of Princess Diana's wardrobe just sold for more than a million dollars. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. This is ABC News Live.
with the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to this evening, including the new indictment filed against Hunter Biden on felony gun charges just days after House Republicans launch a ramped up impeachment probe into President Biden. Plus, the millions now under flood warning as Hurricane Lee makes its way up the Northeast. And a rare look at the center of the storm as our Ginger Z goes on a bumpy ride with hurricane hunters. And the decades old sweater that just sold at auction for more than a million dollars and the icon who wore it. But we do begin with that Hunter Biden and the criminal indictment scenario. The president's son now facing that tonight. The three felony court indictment is related to his purchase of a firearm in 2018 when he was addicted to crack cocaine. It comes after the collapse of a plea deal Hunter Biden made resolving two tax misdemeanors and a gun felony. Of course, all this comes as House Republicans have stepped up efforts to use Hunter Biden's work abroad to try to build a case to impeach President Biden. Regardless of what happens on Capitol Hill, Democratic voters may be growing weary of President Biden. Our Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas leads us off tonight from Washington. Tonight, the president's son indicted on three felony federal gun charges, accused of lying about his drug use to purchase a handgun and then possessing that gun illegally. Hunter Biden bought the Colt revolver in 2018 when he was at the height of his addiction. He has acknowledged using crack cocaine at times as frequently as every 15 minutes. I went one time for 13 days without sleeping and smoking crack and drinking vodka exclusively throughout that entire time. But when Biden bought the gun, he filled out a form saying he was not a drug user, which prosecutors say made the purchase and possession of the gun illegal. Felonies that could put him in prison for more than a decade. The indictment comes after the collapse of Biden's plea deal with the U.S. Attorney for Delaware, David Weiss, appointed by Donald Trump and kept on by Attorney General Merrick Garland to complete the investigation. Weiss had been digging into Hunter Biden for five years, and it seems that they had agreed to a diversion agreement where he wouldn't face a felony gun charge if he complied with certain conditions. Biden had also agreed to plead guilty to misdemeanor tax crimes, Acknowledging failing to pay taxes, he has since paid. But that deal fell apart, and soon after, Weiss asked Garland to name him special counsel. Mr. Weiss has the authority he needs to conduct a thorough investigation and to continue to take the steps he deems appropriate independently. 
Tonight, Hunter Biden's attorney accusing the special counsel of bending to political pressure from Republicans in Congress, insisting Hunter Biden possessing an unloaded gun for 11 days was not a threat to public safety, and arguing that the original deal to drop the gun charge should remain in place. Today's news coming as President Biden was delivering a speech on the economy. No comment on his son's indictment. There's a lot more I know we could talk about. I wish I had a chance to take all your questions, but I'm going to get in real trouble if I do that. Our thanks to Pierre Thomas. Tonight, there's growing danger to coastal areas up and down the East Coast as Hurricane Lee pushes its way up the eastern seaboard. We've already seen huge waves from Florida to Maine. Lee remains an enormous storm. You can see it there stretching more than 300 miles from the center. Tonight, Maine is under a rare hurricane watch. Our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano joins us now. Rob, time this all out for us. Well, Lindsay, we just got word from the hurricane hunters that this wind field, as you mentioned, is huge and continues to expand. Right now, it's about uh, 640 miles from, from where I stand and heading uh, due north. The track hasn't really changed all that much, nor have the impacts. So we're getting the surf here in Rhode Island, and the surf up and down the East Coast will continue with uh, rip currents and beach erosion into the weekend. It probably will weaken some as it gets farther north into cooler waters, but that wind field will still be massive, and by Saturday morning, its closest approach to the U.S. as a hurricane will bring tropical storm force winds to the Cape and through eastern Mass, including Boston, up through Portland and Bar Harbor, where watches have been upgraded to tropical storm warnings. Throw down the rain, it's left loaded, so that's not good news for already saturated, saturated uh, uh, Maine. And uh, we're just getting very, very uh, solid evidence that uh, the surf has arrived here in Narragansett. Over 50 mile an hour winds across parts of Maine through Saturday, so we'll see widespread uh, power outages, I think. But the big storm surge will be across Atlantic Canada, but obviously the big rough waves We'll be up and down the East Coast. We're still two hours from high tide here, uh, Lindsay, and it is getting uh, hairy. We're moving back for sure. Back to we you. see you're getting a little wet there already, Rob. Our thanks to you. Stay safe. And next tonight, we go inside Hurricane Lee. Our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, got a chance to embed with the hurricane hunters who track these dangerous storms. Tonight, a look from inside Hurricane Lee. There's a hurricane. Yeah, there it is. We joined a mission with the hurricane hunters. We are doing what they call the first pass, and I'm just starting to see some storm structure. 17 scientists, pilots, and crew on board, all gathering data, flying into those 115 mile per hour winds. It's really unbelievable. We're just starting to get into the very outer skirts of the storm. About two hours into our flight, we see it. You could see the edge right there of the outside of the eyeball, tracking Lee's strength, speed, and direction. This tube is an instrument, and it is called a drop sonde. Leanne is about to drop many of these right out the airplane through that chute into the eyewall. It will get data like temperature, pressure, wind speed. It'll send all of that info right into tonight's computer models and make a better forecast. With instruments on board, plus sail drones, they saw 28-foot waves near the center of Lee as it churned over the Atlantic. We made multiple passes through the eye wall. We made it through the eye of the hurricane. Now we go into the eye wall on the eastern side. Remember, that's the dirty side, so it could be a little bit more turbulent. Tonight, Lee is weakening but growing in size. Looks like an ice center. The clouds 600 miles across, and hurricane hunters will be on it the whole way. Really fascinating and brave of Ginger. And we turn now to the looming strike as the United Auto Workers Union and the big three auto companies have yet to hammer out a new contract. The union says walkouts will begin at midnight Eastern tonight, which would mark the first collective action against the three auto companies at the same time. While the strike could be costly for the companies, the workers and American consumers, the union says the imbalance in company profits and worker pay cannot continue. ABC's Terry Moran has the latest outside of Detroit. Tonight, nearly 150,000 American auto workers are gearing up to walk off the job at midnight in the first ever strike against all of the big three U.S. automakers. We are preparing to strike these companies in a way they've never seen before. The UAW is turning to new tactics to ramp up the pressure, targeted strikes to disrupt operations at certain plants. Tonight, there is still no deal in sight. 
Workers want a 40% increase in wages over the next four years, in line with the 40% increase they say their CEOs have made since the last contract. And they want pensions, better retiree health care, and cost of living adjustments. The auto workers at UAW Local 600 build the Ford 150 truck. You guys are building like the most popular vehicle in America. Number one selling truck in the world. Our members here work 11 hours a day, six and seven days a week, building the most iconic vehicle for Ford Motor Company. And, you know, they want a fair share in the profit. Those big three profits are soaring $21 billion in just the first six months of this year. We asked Ford CEO about something workers bring up a lot, his $20 million pay package. They're asking about CEO pay. Yours, the CEO, made 20 million, and they say a 40% increase since the last contract. Why can't they get a 40% increase? Well, I, th I think, f first of all, um, we are offering an incredible, unprecedented increase. But we can't even get any feedback from the UAW about what they want. All they want is for everyone to make $300,000. That's not sustainable. We'll go bankrupt if we do that. Ford insists the company can't afford that total compensation package the union wants for its workers. Ford and GM are out with new offers, a 20% wage increase, just half of what the union is looking for. That clock still ticking. Our thanks to Terry. Overseas now to the grim aftermath of that flood catastrophe in Libya and the mounting death toll. At least 6,000 dead, 9,000 more still missing, and at least 30,000 people have been displaced. And tonight in the hard-hit city of Derna, there are mounting questions about why those two dams failed. Our chief foreign correspondent, Ian Panel, has more. Tonight, growing questions about what caused the Libyan flooding disaster. Today, the dead were buried in mass graves amid a humanitarian catastrophe. This is what remains of the coastal city of Derna. More than 6,000 men, women and children died here, with fears the death toll could reach as high as 20,000. City residents bewildered. A lot of people are under the mud. It's a disaster. It's, it's just a disaster. The coastal city was deluged by a wall of water reported to be nearly 23 feet high in parts. Two dams near the city buckling under the weight of storm water. Today, the Libyan prime minister admitting there was a failure to maintain the two dams built over four decades ago. And the UN claiming Libyan weather warnings were inadequate, failing to issue any evacuation orders and officials saying we could have avoided most of the human casualties. Awful to hear that. Our thanks to Ian. Tonight, that escaped killer who was captured after nearly two weeks on the run outside of Philadelphia is spending his first full day in the maximum security prison where he will now serve out his life sentence. But first, Danilo Cavalcante answered questions about how he survived as a fugitive, how close searchers came to finding him, and where he was aiming to go. Trevor Alt reports. Tonight, authorities revealing new details from convicted killer Danilo Cavalcante, how they say he claims he evaded police for 13 days after this daring escape from Chester County Prison. He described things such as going to a watermelon patch, surviving on watermelons, uh, drinking stream water. Cavalcante speaking with investigators for four hours, telling them he hunkered down in the thick woods, narrowly avoiding capture. We were literally right on top of him, but the environment worked to his advantage. This weekend, Cavalcante Conte stealing an unlocked van, driving 25 miles north, a doorbell camera showing him clean shaven, having stolen a backpack with a razor inside. And tonight, we're learning he surveilled homes before breaking in, this week stealing a rifle from an open garage. Ultimately, his end game, he described to us, was carjacking somebody, and that's why he held on to that rifle. His intent was to head north to Canada, and he also expressed a desire to get down to uh, Puerto Rico as well. But early Wednesday morning, tactical units surrounding Cavalcante, this Customs and Border Protection canine taking him down, and that moment of celebration from authorities as the manhunt was finally over. Subject is in custody, confirmed subject is in custody. You said the subject is in custody. Yes! You hear that relief there. Our thanks to Trevor. Cyber attacks are doing some serious damage at casinos from Las Vegas to Atlantic City, shutting down slot machines and ATMs at MGM properties. And Caesars is now revealing that they paid a $15 million ransom before MGM was hit. ABC's Mo Lange reports from Las Vegas. Tonight, a massive cyber attack taking down one of the most recognizable names on the Las Vegas Strip. MGM properties under siege since Sunday. 
The casino floor at the MGM Grand, quiet, without the ringing of slot machines. Messages on screen read, out of service. At New York, New York, some slots are working, but the voucher cash-out system is not. If you want to get any money back at all, then you have to have an employee do it manually. MGM's websites, down. Also affected, ATMs, hotel key cards, some guests being lit in by security with physical keys, also room charges and check-in. The line at the Bellagio, operated by MGM, snaking through the lobby, employees handing out water to frustrated customers. Check-in procedure is kind of messy, a lot of long lines. Gambling's really messy. It's not as fun when you have to wait. It's not just Vegas. MGM casinos and hotels across the country, including Atlantic City, experiencing outages. And today, Caesars Palace in Las Vegas revealing it too was the victim of a cyber attack, paying a $15 million ransom days before MGM was breached. MGM Resorts now working with local law enforcement, the FBI, and cybersecurity experts. They say they're working diligently to get back online. Whether this was ransomware, the, whether this was malware, one would have to think that this was a fairly sophisticated group that launched the attack. Our thanks to Mola. Still much more to get to. Coming up, an Oscar-winning animated film is now getting a new life as a TV series. We talked to Matthew A. Cherry about the star-studded cast and the heartwarming premise of Young Love. But next, the latest in the migrant crisis. A boat shows up on islands with thousands on board where they could be sent next. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. This isn't a fad, this isn't a moment, we're here to stay forever. Latinos, we're hot, we're nice, we're cool. <laughs> Exactamente. The Latin Music Revolution premieres Friday night at 8, 7 central on ABC and stream on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Atlanta, I'm Steve Osinsami. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Tensions are rising on the small Italian island of Lampedusa after officials say 6,700 migrants have arrived by boat this week. That's more than the population of the entire island itself and including more than 250 miners. Many are asking to be relocated to other European Union countries. The island off the coast of Sicily is just 70 miles from Africa. Brazil's Supreme Court sentenced a supporter of former President Bolsonaro to 17 years in prison for storming government offices in January in an alleged bid to restore the right-wing leader to office, the first of several participants who will face punishment. Rioters were refusing to accept that Bolsonaro lost the election to his leftist opponent and current Brazilian president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. And a piece of Princess Diana history is fetching a record price in an online Sotheby's auction. More than $1.1 million 
million, a famous black sheep sweater, a red base, you see it there, featuring a white sheep pattern with a single black sheep. It was worn by Diana to a polo match in London just one month before she married the future king. The intriguing item and all its symbolism attracted 44 bids before being sold to an unknown buyer. In 2020, filmmaker Matthew A. Cherry won an Academy Award for his animated short, Hair Love, the story of a young African-American girl whose father learns to style her natural hair while her mother is in the hospital being treated for cancer. Three years later, the family story continues as a new series on Max called Young Love, starring Issa Rae and Kid Cudi. It picks up when mom comes and the family needs to readjust a bit. Let's take a look. Two months out the hospital and you haven't skipped a beat. Aw, thank you, Steven. See you in a second. Don't be up too late. Is she gone? Wait for it. <laughs> OK, now she's gone. Oh, goodness. Dad, this dude ain't doing it for me. I mean, I didn't want to hurt her feelings, but she got me kicked off the red carpet. Oh, no. Wait, what red carpet? It's figurative, but never mind that. You just need to do something fast. Dad to the rescue, and joining us now is creator, producer, and writer Matthew A. Cherry. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> so let's go back to, to Hair Love for okay. a moment. And when you have this idea um, about a, a black father with his daughter and her hair, mm -hmm. um, what were you so passionate about? Because this is before you even had a child yeah. of your own. Where did you come up with the idea that you were so passionate about that you started this kick, <laughs> uh, Kickstarter campaign in order to, to get people to fund it? Yeah, you know, like back in 2017, when we did the Kickstarter, just the whole landscape of animation looked different. This is before Coco, before Moana, before Spider-Verse. So there just wasn't a ton of representation in animation. And also, uh, I just felt like black father representation was kind of either non non-existent or just outright negative. And um, it just felt like an opportunity to create a character in Zuri who young kids could really see themselves in. You know, Karen Tolliver in her speech said that uh, animation is the first form of media that most, that most kids are exposed to. And it just felt like to have somebody like Zuri who loves her hair, who loves who she is, loves her skin, um, was something I hadn't really seen in a long time and just really wanted to create something like that. It, were you surprised at all to find that this story resonated <laughs> so much? Yes. Um, you know, I think sometimes, like, you have ideas that something may, like, be a good idea, but then just to see the reactions, getting tagged every day, and just different race of fathers who were reading the book to their kid, different classrooms showing the short film and reading the book, it's just been really incredible. You've said that the best art is when you can tie it to a real cause. Yep. Were you surprised that that idea of black hair mm -hmm. was became a cause, really, for people. I did. Um, you know, just growing up, man, like, you know, I, black hair has obviously been a bit of a, uh, has, has had its whole journey, right? Like, from afros to straightened hair. Um, and just, you know, hearing all the stories about kids who are told that they can't graduate if they have braids or locks and, you know, goes all the way to the adult world. Can't be a lawyer if your hair just looks a certain way. Can't be a police officer. You can't be in the Army. So it just felt like it was time to try to address it. And things just happened to really dovetail at the perfect intersection. You know, we had this short film that talked about loving your black hair. And then the Crown Act was created, which stands for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. So um, just really excited that it's passed in so many states and most recently in Texas, and just hopefully it gets passed on the federal level. And you've said that the idea of young love was really born out of you thinking, hair love story isn't finished yet. Yeah. <laughs> what were you hoping to continue on in the next story? Yeah, you know, like, obviously in a lot of the short films and films that we love, oftentimes, you know, the mom or one of the parents ends up passing away, right? And obviously we dealt with a serious health issue with Angela and cancer, and I just thought it was really interesting to see like what happens after you recover, right? Like what is that like? And you know, the show takes place about two months after the events in the short film. So it's very much uh, like a one, you could watch the short film and go right into the series. It just follows a millennial couple and Steven and Angela as they try to live out their dreams. You know, when you're in your 20s, life is a little messy. You haven't really had that career figured out yet. And they're still trying to achieve those dreams, but also trying to be present for their daughter. And that just feels like so relevant to just all the young people that I know today, especially the show set in Chicago and the Midwest. People are having families a little younger than they are on the coast. And um, yeah, just was really excited to dive into all the different little social issues and all the little hijinks that they get into. And this is, of course, an animated series, but yeah. it really feels like there are also some adult themes oh, yeah. in there. Who would you say that, that this is for? 
you know, the show really is for the whole family. You know, we uh, really try to have it be a co-viewing experience that, uh, you know, we have Loretta Devine and Harry Lennox also in the cast who play the grandparents. So we really wanted to have a show that really spoke to all three different generations. And it's just something that we really hope you know, kids, when they're watching the adults, they're able to, like, really be engaged because it deals with relatable things that I think that they can deal with. And also, we hope that kids, I mean, adults are able to really follow Zuri in her journey because she's such a great character. What's next for, for Zuri and, and also <laughs> for you? You know, a lot has already happened. You know, we have a natural hair care line with Dove. Um, the baby board book, uh, Hair Love ABCs, just came out. And so, you know, hopefully we get to continue their story with the second season, depending on how it does. So we're just really excited to have the world re-meet them again, just kind of now with voices. Matthew H. Harry, such a pleasure to have you come by. Really appreciate you. We want to let our viewers know Young Love debuts September 21st with four new episodes rolling out weekly through the season finale on October 5th, all on Max. And still to come, his secret identity may be a fitness instructor, but he's a real-life superhero to many. Detroit Spider-Man tells us how he's using his skills to inspire children. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Finally tonight, Detroit has their own friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, but it's not Peter Parker. It's a 22-year-old parkour instructor and professional free runner who's using his skills to help inspire children. Reporter Faraz Javed from our partner station WXYZ has this story in our local lowdown. Whoa. Spidey? Yes, but not Peter Parker. Instead, it's 22-year-old Kier Gibson, a parkour instructor and pro free runner. Free running is more so flips and uh, free movement. Parkour is more so up and down, rolls, no flipping, just getting from point A to point B as fast as possible. This proud Detroiter has been practicing both arts for the past 12 years, a fascination that started with Spider-Man. He's my favorite hero. He can crawl up walls. He got super strength, super powerful, very agile. Kier found Spidey powers by learning parkour, which also helped him break free from being a shy kid. Kept me off the streets, obviously. Had me learning new skills that I thought I couldn't do, and had me excelling in abilities that I didn't know I had. One of those abilities to teach parkour to other kids. Eight-year-old Eli Patton is one of Kier's students and another Spidey fan. How did you get into parkour? Well, my cousin Kier. I was watching him since I was a kid. Who's a bigger inspiration, he is or Spider-Man? Your cuz? Yes. <laughs> He's better than him. Oh, really? Oh, dang. But I am better than him. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Two, one, go! Why is it important for you to teach this sport slash art to kids? It'll keep them off the streets. It'll keep them from doing the things that they're not supposed to be doing. It'll also enhance their learning and strengthen them in the physical body and strengthen them in the mental mind. Hands down, turn that way first. Kier is now raising funds to buy safety equipment that will allow him to take parkour to more kids in other neighborhoods and eventually open a gym. 
If possible, a building. That's what I'm really looking for. A building and safe space to train these kids. Do you get into trouble, you know, jumping off people's properties and whatnot? You know I have gotten in trouble a few times, yeah. Nothing too major, no cops were called or nothing. It was just like, you know, can you stop doing that here? Can you stay off my property? Things of that nature. Cooler than Spider-Man. Really neat story there. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of the family.